you have your Bibles, guys, I'm going to ask you to turn with me. Uh, we're going to start our reading at 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Uh, second, not 2 Timothy chapter number 2, <laughs> verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 1. And we've been talking about the spirit of generosity uh, over the past weeks or so. Thank God for Brother Bill Parker, our pastor and son who shared with you on last week, brought an awesome word. Uh, but we're picking back up here because I got to finish this. <laughs> Uh, we've been talking about the spirit of generosity and what that means and how it goes beyond just the, just giving of your financial resources. It includes that. Make no mistake about it. If you are a member, a, a covenant member of a, of a local church assembly, it is part of your responsibility and your obligation to sp support that work of ministry to your, through your tithes, offering, and sacrificial givings. Is that understood? We've taught that, and we know what the Bible says about that. We don't beat you over the head. We teach you, and we exhort you. Now, it's up to you to do the word. But generosity goes beyond just monetary resource. We talked about several areas that, that, uh, that generosity should be exuded in, including showing hospitality on down the line, including exercising our spiritual gift, using your gift to serve the body of Christ. It can be very selfish and stingy. Everybody say stingy. Can I say it like we said it when we were growing up in the country? It's what? Stangy. Now, I don't know how you spell that, but, you know, just kind of a colloquialism right there, right? It's very stingy for you to have your gift and you sit on it. It's very stingy of you as a Christian to be endowed with spiritual giftings and not allow the body of Christ to, 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 to get the benefit of seeing that gift in operation because your gift helps us to grow. Can I get a witness? So we got to get to the spirit of generosity where we say in, my, in our minds and our hearts that whatever God wants to do through me, I'm available for him to do it through me. Amen. If he wants to use anybody, God, here am I, use me. Can I get a witness? So now we get into this part here. This, this part is really, 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 really important. All of it is important, but this part is really, really, really important. Everybody say, really? Really, really, really important. It goes to the heart of what Christianity is all about. It goes to the heart of what we as born-again believers should be all about. I'm telling you as your pastor, my desire and my heart is for not to you just to get saved and go to heaven. Thank God that you're saved and going to heaven. But my desire for all of us as born-again believers is to make sure that we are manifesting and we are part of that great commission, that great plan that God said, Jesus said before he left to go back up into heaven, okay? And we're going to look at that in just a second. We need to be involved in the disciple-making process. Amen? So we look in this text here. The Apostle Paul is writing here, and he's writing... Uh, to his young son in the ministry by the name of Timothy. Paul, at the time that he writes this letter, guys, giving you some context, Paul was facing death. Are you all with me today? He was facing death not because he was terminally ill with some uh, disease that was not curable, but he was facing death because he was convicted of being a follower of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you were put on trial... I'm wondering, I'm wondering right now how many of us, if we were put on trial, would be found guilty of being a disciple maker for Jesus Christ? If you were sitting before the judge and the jury was there and the prosecuting attorney was over there trying to come up with some stuff on you to show that you, yeah, you did it, you made that disciple over there. I wonder how much evidence would they have. The sad reality is, guys, in the church world today, not a whole lot of folks would be convicted of being a disciple maker. You may get, be convicted of being a born-again believer, but Jesus wants us to be disciple-makers. Can I get a witness? So Paul here is in jail, in a cold, uh, uh, damp Roman uh, jail cell, uh, writing this letter to his son in the ministry by the name of Timothy. He was, he was in jail because he was, he, was, he, was, he was getting ready to go to his death because of his stand for Christ. And many times we... Uh, we, we are familiar with Paul's writing from this letter because at most funerals we hear that second chapter, verse, the, the, second, the fourth chapter in verses 6 through 8 when Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure what, is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, 
the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. How many of y'all have heard that read at, at funerals before? Paul, Paul knew that his time was short. He knew that his execution date was coming, but he's sitting there in the jail cell. That's what I like about my man Paul. Paul was so doggone focused on his mission, even in the face of death, he's thinking about promoting the gospel. He's thinking about his young son in the ministry to encourage him in his walk with the Lord. So, so Paul, Paul knew that he would soon be executed, so he wrote his final thoughts to his son, Timothy, passing to him the torch of leadership, reminding him of what was truly important and encouraging him in the faith. In essence, Paul is fulfilling the Great Commission. Let's read this right quick, and we're going to go to Matthew, the 20th chapter. There is something missing in our churches today. And it's not about the music. It's not about the, 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 the way the building looks. It's not about uh, what denomination is, is doing this or doing that. The thing that is missing, I believe, with all my heart, mind, and soul is the lack of commitment on the part of believers to follow the great commission of being disciple makers. With, with, there is a sense of complacency, if you will, that has overshadowed the church in America, especially today, if you go to other countries where the gospel is spreading exponentially, people are giving their life for the gospel, you, you'll see miracles breaking out. You'll see lives being transformed. But sometimes when you look at the church in America, we become complacent and we're okay with just coming and sitting. We're okay with having our comfort zone. No, no don't bother me. Don't make me uncomfortable. Don't let me be around folk I don't want to be around. I just want to do me. And I got news for you. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're going to follow him, a man like Paul did, you're going to have to get uncomfortable. I got one amen. I, get, I didn't hear one amen on that. You're going to have to get uncomfortable and get out of self and say, God, however you want to use me, use me. Watch what Paul says to Timothy here, and then we're going to go to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Let's read. Timothy... My dear son, be strong. Can we read together? Can we read together? Let's read. Bible reading is still needful, okay? Can we read together? Let's read. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Let's read. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Read that last sentence from again. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people to pass them on to others. Commit this to faithful men, the KJV says, who will be able to pass it on to others. Let's go to Matthew, the 28th chapter, Verse number 19, talking about the spirit of generosity and, and talking about our responsibility to be stewards over God's truth. Stewards over God's truth. Stewards over the gospel message. Now, I want you to think with me just for a second. Over the last five years, let's go back five years. Can y'all remember that far back? <laughs> Sometimes I can't. I'm, I'm just... I'm just if you go back over the last five years, how many people have you shared your testimony with and how many people have you shared the gospel message with in an effort to try to bring them into a saving relationship with Christ Jesus? How many people have you intentionally set out and said, you know what, as I deal with this person on a daily basis, I perceive that they don't really understand what it means to have a true commitment to Jesus Christ. And you can tell who understands who had a true, what it means to have a true commitment to Jesus Christ. You can tell by lifestyle. You can tell by language. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, to me, guys, I was in the store buying uniforms the other day, and it, it's, it's appalling to me the, the type of language that's utilized uh, out in public where people just don't even really care about what they're saying and who's around them. Yeah. I'm sitting there in the store, and it was, it was three people at least were just, just using, dropping F-bombs and MFs and SHIT and all. I mean, they're in the store. 
What I'm saying, where is that S-H-I-T at? It's called a uniform. Use your common sense and some intelligence and be able to talk with a sense of decency. But it's, it, it happens all the time in our songs that are being sang, in, in, in our homes where parents are, are saying, talking this foul language, and is it any wonder that children do the very same thing? But, but, but I, I was appalled, but you can tell what people are by how they talk out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says what? The mouth speaking. And if there's foulness and sinfulness in the abundance of the heart, it'll come bubbling out of your mouth. And especially when it comes to profanity. As I said, I'm, I'm one who, I, just, I hate that because people think that's okay. But I said there's enough words in the English dis- dictionary, in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, for you to be intelligent enough to use those than to go get something that ain't in there. Especially, now I don't expect any better from the world, but, I, but Christians, cussing, foul mouth Christians. Y'all getting real quiet up in here. There must be some cussing, foul mouth Christians up in here. Do you not realize that it ruins your testimony? So I start out by saying, we, how many people have you intentionally said, you know what? Based off my interaction with this person, I don't. I never hear them talk about Jesus. I never see their, their lifestyle is not indicative of somebody who's following Christ. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to run away from him because I'm not going to run away from the person who's a cusser. Are you following me? I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to try to build a bond and a relationship so I can have an opportunity to pour into their life. Can I get a witness? All right? So watch this. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. The word, the word nation there is the root word, uh, ethnos, which we get our word ethnicity. It's not talking about a country. It's talking about go to all nation, all nationalities. It started with the Jew and then the Gentile, the Greek, which every other ethnicity besides the Jew is a Gentile. It says, go and make disciples of all nationalities, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Look at this verse. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. That's reading from the King James Version of that very same scripture. Listen to it. Listen to it real carefully. He says this, Go ye therefore, and what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Now, when you look at this, this passage right here, and you Think about who Jesus was talking to at this time, his followers, his disciples. It's fascinating to consider the folks who Jesus chose to carry out his mission. I'll tell you all this before. Look at the list of the disciples he entrusted to deliver the greatest message that's ever been given. He used Andrew, who was an introvert, to be a follower of Christ. Some of y'all may be introverted. You're not a very extroverted person. You know, you, you, you're kind of quiet. You, you don't easily mess with people. But guess what? God can still use you. Are y'all with me today? Andrew was an introvert. Peter was a loudmouth, impulsive dude who had a habit of talking before he thinks. Y'all remember Peter, right? But guess what? Bobby, God used him. That impulsive dude who took his sword off and cut the dude's ear off. You know, Peter was a, Peter had, how many of y'all had got a little gangster in you still? <laughs> some of y'all got a little gangster in you. I'm scared of some of y'all. <laughs> but Peter was that dude. Yet and still God used him and called him to be a disciple. What about James and John? James and John, these cats, if y'all recall in the Bible, they wanted to call down fire from heaven and just burn the Samaritans up. Just burn them up, God. They don't like us. They they come against us. Burn them up, God. Some of y'all got the same mindset, too, about sinners. Simon the Zealot. Y'all know what a zealot is? That's a card-carrying political activist. If you allow me to use my spiritual imagination, Simon the Zealot would, would be like the MAGA folks on the right and the Antifa folks on the left. Just flat out crazy. He was a zealot. But yet, God called them 
to be his disciples. He says, come, I'm going to make you fishers of men. If you and I were selecting the team, these men would not be our first round draft pick, Brother Danny. <laughs> now, they, they would have been the last round or, or, or maybe a free agent or maybe just a camp tryout guy. It's kind of like, yeah, I remember, uh, you know, when you, when you were younger and you were in the playground playing pickup ball. Gary, you'll remember this. Um, uh, you know, when, you, when you're picking teams, some guys will always pick last. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's just playgrounds can be cruel, right? Yeah. Brother, oh, you know, if, if you couldn't shoot and couldn't rebound, people are like, okay, who else? Uh, who else? I got him. Uh, uh, now, O can shoot. I mean, he can play ball. I mean, he played college ball. But, but those guys who couldn't play usually got picked what last? Any of y'all been overlooked before? Huh? But on the playground, look, it's, 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 these guys would have been the last one to get picked for the pickup game. But why did God do it this way, guys? Go, one of my favorite passages to go to is 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Start reading at verse number 18. Let's go to right. Why did God do it this way? Why did he choose the least likely, the, the, the probably not the, the smartest and certainly not the wealthiest of people? You know, they had some means. They, left, they had a fishing business. So they had some means. But he didn't choose those who, had theolo- who went to seminaries and, and had all this theological education. He chose the guys who were least likely to be chosen. I'm going to tell you why he did it. Y'all are, you should already know this. Watch what Paul says here. Can we read together? Let's read. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Do you not know some people think you foolish for coming and listening to Doyle Adams preach to you for 55 minutes? Mm. Do you not realize that people think that you are foolish for coming and supporting the work of the ministry? That's imaginary. But let me tell you something. You who've seen God work in your life know it's not imaginary. You who God has healed your body, regulated your mind when you're about to go crazy. You who God has restored broken relationship. You who God has made a way out of no way. You who God who saved your soul from a burning hell know and understand that this thing is real. Yes, God is real. Can I get a witness? But he says this, listen, as the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. Watch this, read it, go back. I need to hear, y'all to hear that again. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, those in the world who think they're wiser than, than God, and I will do what? Discard the intelligence of the intelligent. Keep reading, let's go. So where does this lead the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Let's keep going, guys. He says, since God and his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, you ain't gonna, you're not going to know him through human wisdom. You can't go to college and, know, and, and learn Jesus by studying a book. It is a revelatory, Holy Spirit-inspired transformation that has to take place in your life. He says, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Keep going, guys. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. Let's go, guys. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Keep going. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. But what the text says here. He says, instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. Why do you do it that way? God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all. Some people didn't think you were very much coming up. But look at you now. God has saved your soul. God has turned your life around. God is now using you to touch other people's lives. Then God is now something that seemed to be nothing and doing a whole lot through it. 
He says this, these things count as nothing is all and used them to bring to nothing the world, what the world considers to be important. Here we go. As a result, because God did it that way, because he chose to use us, the least likely one, the guy who was last picked on the basketball court, as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. You can't go to God and say, well, well God, all this stuff was done because I, I funded the whole church budget. God, all this stuff was done because, you know, I have my, after all, I have my PhD and I'm the smartest guy in the room. Some people think they're the smartest guy in the room all the time. And literally, they, they turn out to be the dumbest one in the room when it comes to spiritual things. Because whatever you teach and whatever you say has to be undergirded by a spiritual construct. Otherwise, the enemy will come in and tear it down. Or when times get tough, and when times get to be where it's not smooth, then you will break and run and you will break down because you don't, you're not undergirded by the spiritual truth of God's word. As a believer, that's important for us, to have doctrinal foundation. Tell me what you believe, but I want to know why you believe what you believe, and I want to see it from the word of God. Can I get a witness? I'm, I'm with you all day long. I, I, I like talking Bible. I like I like good expository preaching, taking the word of God, breaking it open, seeing what it says, and now seeing how it applies to my individual life. Can I get a witness today? So, so watch, watch. Keep, keep moving. He did it so that no flesh could glory in his presence. Jesus bypassed, again, the, 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 the ones who everybody else would have picked, and he chose the least likely one. This motley crew that he assembled, again, wasn't what everybody else would have done, but he used it so that those who are wise according to this world uh, couldn't take any credit for what God was doing. You know, one of the most common excuses that people give as to why they aren't involved in making disciples is some people say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of the unknown. And many times what they mean by that is, I don't know those people. You can't trust people. You can't let everybody into your house. Stuff like this we're saying. You know people are something else, Pastor. You know people will disappoint you, Pastor. What did Jesus tell you to do? I, I just need you to help me to understand if he says this is our assignment, why are we in our stubbornness saying, I don't want to do that assignment, but yet we want God? Any of your children like, like this, they want your money, but they don't want your advice. Yeah. Do any of y'all have some children? I, I, need, I need a show of hands. How many of y'all have children who come to you, want your money, but don't want to listen to your wise counsel? I ain't asked for all that, Mom. Is she going to help me or not? Baby, let me tell you something. You coming to me and asking me for what the Lord has blessed me with, and I owe it to you because this ain't the first time you came. This is number 19. <laughs> I owe it to you to give you sound counsel because if I don't give it to you and you don't act on it, you're going to be back here again next week. But that's the way some people are with God. They want salvation. They want God's healing power of their life. They want God to regulate their mind. They want God to do all these things, but they don't want God's word. Or they want it the way they want it. We got to get to the point, guys. And all of us, hear me carefully, all of us, point to yourself, I'm pointing to me, all of us have the tendency to get this way about certain things in life where we want to do it our way. God nudges you, wakes you up, at 4.30 in the morning, you don't normally get up at 4.30. Normally, you're a late, a late riser up. You get up at 7, 7.30 or 8 or 9 <laughs> or just when you get up. <laughs> now, see, when you retire, Lord, you can get up when you want to get up. Amen? Unless the Lord wakes you at 4.30 and says, I need you to pray right now. I need to see the hands of anybody that the Lord is waking you out of a sound sleep early in the morning, and you were there, you couldn't go back. So you, you sat there rather than, <laughs> come on, you sat there and made yourself go back to sleep. When God had you woke, woke early in the morning, it's something about early. <laughs> the Bible says Jesus rose up early before day and went out to pray. It's something about that. But when God does that, your flesh 
is used to staying in the bed and your flesh says, lay here, it ain't time yet. But God is saying, I got to get you out of that routine. I need you to move when I tell you to move. I need you to learn to trust me because when you move when I tell you to move, then now I can use you how I want to use you. I can trust you to do what I say. Some of us, God can't trust us to move when he says move. Are y'all still tracking with me today? So, so people will say, well, you know, I don't trust people. I don't, you, know, you can't. You. Baby, let me tell you something. If you're going to love people, people will disappoint you. I, granted, that happens. Uh, you know, uh, I've been passing it for 33 years, guys. And, 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 and I, I believe, I personally believe, because I, I, I didn't do a survey of every church, but I know that I, based off of my experience and based off of the, the, uh, the conversation I've had with a lot of different pastors, I believe this is a blessed church. But in, in, in a blessed church, you can lead well, and people may not agree with you, uh, and, and you're not going to agree with everything that I say. But, but all I do is tell you, okay, let's, let's find it in the book where I told you something wrong. And if you can show me in the book where I told you something wrong, then, hey, let's, I'll correct it. But don't tell me, well, I just, you know, I just don't feel that way. It's not about what you feel. It's about what God's Word says. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is that fair? Is that, how would y'all want... How would y'all like for me to come and just preach what I feel all the time? Sometimes I don't, sometimes you may not can't tell it, but sometimes I, I may feel like I don't want to talk to you right. <laughs> anybody in the house? How many of y'all got people who you love and you love them more than anybody in the whole doggone world? You sleep in the same bed with just your spouse, but sometimes you don't really want to talk to them lovely, <laughs> pure, just of a good report. Think on those things. No, you want to kind of tell them something. <laughs> if I'm lying, I'm dying. <laughs> right? But we've learned how to control those thoughts to bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. So that we speak the words that give life rather than death to that situation. Some people don't want to become disciple makers because they say, I don't know enough biblical knowledge to disciple someone. Let me tell you something. If you got a testimony, you can disciple somebody. If you have, if you have, if, if you can tell what the Lord has done for you, right? then you can share that with somebody else and get them saved. Now, again, I would grant, grant you, in order to really be a true disciple maker, you got you to teach those things that, that you've observed and learned. Yeah. That's what Jesus said, right, in Matthew 20 chapter. Those things that you've, that you've learned and that you've observed, teach those to those who you, you, you've led into a personal relationship with me. So you gotta, you got to spend some time in the Word. you got to become a part of the discipleship training process so you can be equipped to go get somebody else. But you don't have to know the whole Bible front and back Amen. to help disciple someone. Live a lifestyle in front of people. Yeah. Can I get a witness? Amen. So, so, when we look at this thing, we, we got to get to the point where we don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit to work within our life. Most Christians will, will, will admit that they have some insecurities about their ability to help disciple somebody. Would y'all agree? A lot of us are full of insecurities, and we have some doubts. However, God can use any one of us in here. A healthy dependence upon God is necessary in order for us to invest in others to be obedient to what Matthew, the 28th chapter says. Listen to me very carefully. Don't estimate the power of the Holy Spirit and the impact of the word of God. You are not in this by yourself. Let me say it again. You are not in this by yourself. You are not in this by yourself. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you empowers you to be able to help disciple someone. Can I get a witness? We're not alone. And thank God that we're not alone. God never designed us to walk this walk by ourselves. Jesus is with you every step of the way, so let's become disciple makers. You know, if if Jesus had said in Matthew 20, 19, go ye therefore and make converts of all nations, converts, the church would be doing okay, probably doing an okay job with getting converts, get them down the aisle, give the preacher your hand, give your heart to the Lord, get baptized, been converted. You remember the day, you remember the hour. But when you think about it, 
getting converts was not the thing that Jesus told him to do. He told him to go and make disciples. The problem is, again, Jesus didn't say and instruct them to make converts. He said make disciples. He didn't even encourage us to build church buildings. He didn't, instead, he commanded something specific. Make disciples of all ethnicities. He didn't say black folk go to black folk, white folk go to white folk, Asian folk go to white, Asian folk, Hispanic folk go to... If, 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 I can't even talk. Hispanic folks. He said, go and make disciples of all nationalities, which means that my mindset, if I'm going to be kingdom focused, has to be on doing kingdom business and doing it the kingdom way and not my way. Are y'all tracking with me today? All right? So let's... let's, let, let, let's, let's get into some things I think that can help us in my time, a lot of time that's left, okay? First thing I want you to make note of is, number one, discipleship without reproduction is not biblical discipleship. Discipleship without reproduction is not biblical discipleship. God gave us a picture of, disciple, of this disciple-making process all the way back in the Garden of Eden. The process of multiplication, the process of replication, the process of reproduction are as old as the Old Testament itself. They're as old as mankind. Go to Genesis, the first chapter, verse number 27 with me. Genesis 1 and 27. From the very beginning, God instilled three principles of multiplication, replication, and reproduction into everything that mankind does. Watch what the text says here. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them what? Male and female, he created them. Watch this. First and foremost, he created, number one, he created us to bear the very image and likeness of himself. What, look at this again. God created human beings in his what? Own image. Most of y'all have read that and just brushed across that the whole time you've been saved. But think about what he's saying there. God says, I'm making you in my image. I, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So first, he created us to bear the very image, his very image and his likeness. He imprinted us with his divine fingerprint that each person bears either well or not so well. All right? So first, he, we, we bear his image. Secondly, he entrusted us to preserve his word, to preserve his word. One of the first instructions he gave Adam and Eve, guys, was a command. He expected them to guard his word, although they did it irresponsibly. He told them, listen, I'm placing you here in the garden, dress it and keep it. You got free reign over everything, but just don't touch that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was God's word. God expects us to protect his word. That's why as your pastor, guys, I, you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you Bible. And I'm, I'm going to put the Bible out there for you, for you to see it, to understand it. And now you got to make a conscious decision whether I'm going to be obedient to it or not. Because once you find out what the word says, you're held responsible. Is that right? As, as a parent, if your child doesn't know what you've directed, it's kind of hard for you to go and punish them for something you hadn't taught them against. Right? Uh, you know, uh, I think I'm going to tell you, I think it was one time, I don't know if it was Sandra, it may have been Junior, he used a, 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 a bad word. And he had heard, I don't know where he heard it from, but he was, uh, he, he could have been no more than five, maybe six. And then we asked him, what you say, son? He said it again, real, this bold. I mean, it wasn't like it was anything that was called, it was, you know, he just said it again. I said, what did you say, son? He said it again. So what that told me was, right now, I, that particular word he used, I hadn't taught him that's a bad word. He heard it, he picked it up. How many of y'all know your children in the day, fast forward 25 years or whatever, 20 years, and, and, and look at where our children are now. What are they exposed to? They're exposed to much more than you were when you were living in the country, uh, back there uh, on, the, on the backside of the desert, and all y'all had was 3, 6, and 12 TV. And then you got the nerve to say, well, you know, when I was coming up, 
The reason why some of y'all didn't do much when you were coming up because you couldn't do much when you were coming up. You didn't have the opportunity. But, but our children are exposed to a whole lot today. And guys, we got we to be on point and making sure that we're training and teaching them what's right and what's wrong. So he entrusted, uh, he entrusted them, uh, mankind, to preserve his word. When he told them, don't touch and eat, they irresponsibly went and touched and they ate. Because the enemy, the enemy is always coming. That was Satan in the garden. He's always coming to discredit God's word. He does not want you to understand God's will for your life. And when you do understand, he'll come and try to twist it to make that which is sin seem to be righteousness. I told you a couple Sundays ago that God, the enemy is trying to put pressure from the outside to get the church to call sin righteousness and righteousness sin. Right? He's not satisfied with you doing right and the world doing sin. No, he wants the church to promote sin. He wants the church to call sin righteousness and righteousness sin. And we have that happen in a lot of our churches today. That which is clearly defined in the word of God, people are going against it and saying, well, you know, it's, that, that's for y'all. Well, now, if you are born again believer, the word of God is for you, if you're truly born again. So thoroughly, he empowered us to multiply on earth. He gave Adam the responsibility and the ability to subdue the earth. Knowing the first couple, if they were left to their own desires, they, they, they couldn't do it by themselves. With this power came the ability, guys, to procreate and to multiply. He said, be fruitful and multiply. He gave human beings a broader reach, both geographically and chronologically, than he did all the other stuff he created. Are y'all with me? And so this kind of replication of, that Adam and Eve were subject to was the same as it is today, to produce children according to the values of mom and dad. The same goes for the discipleship process. We need to produce somebody uh, according to what the Word of God teaches us. In other words, uh, if, if, you, if, if you remember, remember what Ephesians 6 and 4 said. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. That's our responsibility to, 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 to with our children to place a, a, a foundation of faith in them. Now, ultimately, they got to make the decision to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And I thank God for that. Next Sunday, we're going to baptize about six or seven of our young ones. Y'all ought to be clapping on that. <laughs> Baptism, because they made a decision to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's what this thing is all about. Once they make that decision, we got to spend time cultivating and developing them so they can make right choices and right decisions so they can become a disciplined one. So discipleship without reproduction is not biblical discipleship. In other words, you ought to be reproducing yourself, your God self, not your self self. I said not your self self. Let me say it again. Reproducing your God self, the God in you, allowing his word and his will to permeate through your life so much so that your children, as they see you living. Let me say this right quick, and I'm going to say it boldly and unashamedly. Your children aren't going to do what they hear you talk about at church. They're going to do what they see you do at home. Your children are confused in a lot of cases, and I've said it before and I've said it again, they're confused in a lot of cases because they see you act one way here when you're around Christians, and when you're around other folk, yeah, you turn it up. <laughs> oh. And they're wondering, which one is it? Guys, let me tell you something. The greatest response, one of the greatest responsibilities that you could ever have is the role of a parent and pouring into your children gospel truths, living a life. None of us are perfect, guys, but, but some stuff is just doggone ridiculous. The way we respond, the way we act, the way we fight, fuss and fight as husband and wife in front of our children and expect that not to have any impact on them. Unfortunately, because sin is in the world, divorce is in the world, divorce affects children. Whether you, whether you, I don't care how good a friend you and, your, and the ex are, it affects your children. 
And I'm not saying that in some cases, you know, it's, it's not God's will. In some cases, God gave out for divorce in, some, in, in limited circumstances. But it affects your children. If you weren't ready to get married, you shouldn't have got married. I said, <laughs> if your mind was not right, if you were not focused on the things of God, you should have never gotten married. Amen. Marriage is honorable and all in the bed and the foul, but as I always say, it's the folks who's in the, in the institution that act like they should be in another institution <laughs> that's giving marriage a bad rap. Be who God called you to be. You will, number two, you will reproduce what was introduced to you. And that's what some of our children are doing. They're reproducing what you introduced to them. Some good and some not so good. You think that how you lived in front of them wasn't going to impact them, and now they're 25 and 30 or 35 and 40, and they messed up. I'm serious, they messed up. Because they saw you come to church, but never lived this stuff out. They saw you come to church and say you love Jesus, but hate folks that don't look like you. Oh, you don't call it hate. You call it, oh, this is my preferences. I would tell you that the scripture says that, that we are to love all people. Now, show me, show me different. And I'll back off of that. But the love of God transcends uh, uh, denomination. It transcends culture. It transcends ethnicity. The love of God, amen, is so powerful and so strong that it is unconditional. But our children pick up some of our stuff. They, you, you don't even know they're watching you, but they're watching you. And they can probably mock you too. Huh? Because they watch you. So, so, so you will reproduce what was introduced to you. Look, look, look what he says here in 2 Timothy chapter one, 2, verse 1 and 2 again. Can we get there? Let's go. Are y'all still tracking with me today? I hope you understand what I'm saying. When we're talking about spirit of generosity, we're talking about being a steward. And our stewardship over the gospel has to get better because Jesus told us to make disciples, not just converts, but to become a disciple maker. In order to become a disciple maker, you have to replicate the things that God has placed on the inside of you. Amen? Let's read it. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other people trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Wow. Look at this. He didn't say teach this to everybody. Some of y'all, listen, if you're not hungry, you're not going to eat. That's, did, I, that, did I just say hungry? As if there was an O in that word. If you're not hungry, you're not going to eat. If you're not hungry for spiritual things, your pastor can't help you. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Some of y'all are not hungry enough. Can I pastor you today? Will you allow me to pastor you? Because I can't pastor you if you don't let me pastor you. Some of y'all have never signed up for a discipleship training class, and you're a member of this church. That's in disobedience. Well, you know, my pastor, life is busy. I got all these things. Do I need to break the Bible out for you? Well, I got all this stuff going on, pastor. You understand? Listen, so you're so busy. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what God, let God just take away the little job you got. Let God just take away that air you're breathing. Let him take away that health that you've been enjoying. See, sometimes we take good health for granted. But one thing I've learned, especially as I get older, as I, as, I, as I go to funeral after funeral, one thing I've learned, it is a blessing to have good health. Are y'all with me? But some of us take it for granted 
and we tell God we don't have time. And God says, I call you to not just be saved, but I call you to be a disciple maker. And you can't become a disciple maker if you're not willing to be a disciple yourself. So if you remember this church, that's, that's, that's disobedience to not to even try. Can I say it again? That is disobedience not to even try. Well, ain't no man going to tell me what to do. I run my own house. Prideful self. Go to the book. Go to the word of God. Paul told Timothy, I think it was Timothy, studied to show thyself approving to God. A workman who need not be ashamed, who, but who rightly divides the word of truth. If you can rightly divide, you can wrongly divide. That's why it's important to get connected with a, with a cohort of your fellow believers who you, you said the Lord told you to become a part of the church. I didn't say it. You said it. So if, you, if, if the Holy Spirit led you to be up under my leadership, you, you knew how I, I preached before you came here. Some of y'all checked me out for two or three months online before you ever stepped foot inside the door. And you know that I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay? So let's get out of this lazy spell, these doldrums that the pandemic seems to have brought upon the church, and let's get back to hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Some of us aren't filled with the things of God because we're not hungry enough. Okay? How many of y'all, if you, if, if you get hungry enough, you're going to go find something to eat? Anybody? You've been hungry late at night, and you're already in for the night, and you go, you go to the refrigerator and open the door like something going to magically appear. You know you didn't cook before you went to the refrigerator. And I just look and just hold. And I don't want to just hold the door open like, I got to find something. See, when you're hungry... You will not let anything stop you from getting the word of God on the inside of you, but some of you are not hungry enough. Oh, Lord. You will reproduce what was introduced to you. He says, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on. Others. Everybody's not trustworthy. Watch what he says. If you will, um, flip. Let, let's go back up to, help me, go back to the first chapter. And, and let's look at what Paul told Timothy here. And let's start in verse number 13. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13, okay? So we're on, we're on number 2, right? Okay, I think I can get 3, and we're going to stop. Watch what Paul says, because see, some of us, some of us are the mindset, some of us don't have a kingdom mindset because we think that church is like a democracy. You do it if you want to do it, you don't want to do it. See, if, you, if you're going to enter God's kingdom, you got to enter with the mindset that, that God, I, 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 I accept you as my Lord and my Savior, and I'm going to do everything you told me. Kingdom living is obedience to the things of God. It is not a democracy, Okay? It's kingdom. It's a theocracy. It is, it is Jesus Christ, our king. He's the one who's leading us and guiding us, and he gives us his word to show us which way to go. Right, but watch what Paul says here. Watch, watch this. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learn from me, a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus. Look at the next verse. Let's go, guys. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully do what? Guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. This gospel has not only been entrusted to me as a pastor, but it's been entrusted to you as a follower of Christ, as a member of this church. You've been entrusted with the gospel message. My question to you today is, how generous are you with it? We're talking about the spirit of generosity. And we're talking about the stewardship over God's truth. How generous are you in spreading what you've learned? The gospel. He says, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. Next verse. Let's go, guys. As you know, watch this. 
Everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me. This is Paul in jail, facing execution, writing this letter to encourage this young son in the ministry by the name of Timothy. He says, they, everybody in Asia has deserted me, even for jealous and hom homogenous. He called them by name. He called them by he says, as you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me, even for jealous and homogenous. In one other passage of scripture, uh, y'all remember, I think it's in third John, one of the Johns, they talked about diatrophies. They call his name. When you are a troublemaker in the church, your name need to be called out. Because some folks sow discord in the church. Paul called them out right here. Is it second? Maybe third John. Is it third John? They call out Diotrephes. He, he loved to have the premise. Diotrephes loved to be in charge, and he gave the apostles and all the traveling evangelists a hard time. He ruled the church. John called him out. What are you saying, brother, pastor? You call, I'm saying somebody who's disrupted to that level needs to be identified and talked to. You follow me? <laughs> Watch this. Let's go. It says, next verse. May the Lord show special kindness to Anisiphorus and all his family because he often visited and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in chains. Paul's in jail, and he commends Anisiphorus right here for not being embarrassed to come visit him. 17, 18, just for good measure. Let's read. When, I, when he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. Okay? Now, what he says in this next chapter, he says, commit this to faithful men who be able to teach others. Let me say this right quick. I, in my 33 years of pastor, and, I, and I'm encouraging y'all to get engaged with the discipleship process, but I know some of y'all aren't serious. And if you've been here 20 years and not serious about your faith walk, I'm scared of you. Because what's going to happen is, and I'm, I'm telling you, God will deal with you if you belong to him. He gives you a word from me. He's telling you right now. He's telling you right now. He's, tell, he's talking to you through me. Telling you that as we, as we begin our next semester of discipleship training, you need to be signed up. That's the word that comes to me. Then he's going to prick you through the Holy Spirit. But some of y'all still aren't going to listen because you, after all, you, you've been doing this thing. I, hey, me and God got an understanding, all right? But now, see, now, now that you know better and you're a member of this church and you know what the expectation is, then God's going to hold you accountable for the expectation of the house that you said you were led to be a part of. So he gives you a word. He convicts you by the Holy Spirit. And one of the other things he'll do, he'll, he'll begin to deal with you in your circumstances. Since you won't pay attention to your pastor, I tell you what, I'll get you to pray a little bit more. When I'm, I'm, I'm going to just step back. What God does is he just steps back and leaves you to your reprobate mind. Void of understanding, thinking that you got it all together. And so now he starts letting you. See, when, when your circumstances are touched, then you start looking up. Because when I just said what I said, you look down and said, hmm. I don't know who he think he's talking to. Ain't no man going to tell. Guys, let me tell you something. The, 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 the ultimate sin that, 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 that the Bible says God hates is the sin of pride. I will never get so prideful that I can't learn something, especially from the word of God. So I'm going to encourage you. That's, that's my pastoral role, to encourage you to grow. But I, I understand in order to do that, you got to be hungry. And if you're not hungry, I don't care how much I bring to the table, you're not going to eat. But I pray for you. I do. I and I ain't mad at you. I love you still, but I'm still going to tell you the truth. Is that fair enough? Yes. You can get mad at me. That's, that comes with the territory. I know some of y'all been mad at me, but that's good. <laughs> as long as you're challenged to do what's right. I want you to get so mad at me that you go search the scripture and say, let me, let me prove this joker wrong. <laughs> and then when you start searching, 
and the Holy Ghost get a hold of your little pea brain mind. I, I'm sorry. Your, your, your reprobate or carnal mind, y'all hear me? Then now when you let the Holy Spirit do what he does, then now when you were first against what God was saying, now that you studied it and got out of your feelings and got into the word of God, you're like, okay, now I see what I didn't see. I tell your brother, bless me, when he shared with me, he said, Pastor, listen, man, I was against what you were teaching. But then he got into the Word and started studying. He said, you know, now I see what you were saying. Many times we are not receiving from God because we, are, we allow our feelings and our experiences to trump the Spirit of God and His Word. And as your pastor, what I'm telling you is, is that if you will get into the Word of God with the mindset not to prove anybody anything, but to say, God, I want to know what your will is for my life. I want to line my life up with your will for my life because I want to please you. It ain't about the pastor. It ain't about my mama. It ain't about my daddy. It's about pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you have that mindset, God will feed you. So you will reproduce what was introduced to you. Everybody, he didn't tell Timothy to, to, to share this with everybody because everybody is not. Can, can we go back there as I close on this? 2 Timothy 2, verse number 2. Notice, I, I don't want you to miss this. 2 Timothy 1. And, is it? No, 2 Timothy 2, verse, verse number 2. I'm sorry. Can we read it out loud on purpose? Notice what Paul tells him. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to everybody. What, what did he say? He says, now teach these truths who will be able. So, so what, what am I saying? You know, as a pastor, uh, like I said, I learned, I, I'm not going to chase you down to try to make you do anything. I'm just not. Because if you're doing it because I'm telling you to do it and, and, you, and you're doing it <laughs> out, of, out of whatever, then you really can't get blessed anyhow. Because what this tells me is I'm going to take people who are willing to learn and willing to do the word of God, and we're going to move. Because he says, now teach these truths to other trustworthy. Are you trustworthy enough for, for, for us to sit down and read out of Scripture on a, on a regular basis and be taught? I know you're trustworthy coming on Sunday. But I'm talking about discipleship training. Are you, are, are you trusting your leadership enough to say, they're giving me the word of God, and even when I don't quite understand it, I trust my leadership that they're giving me the word, and I'm going I'm to pray for understanding? Because if not, you'll never get beyond yourself. And don't ever get so old. Listen, I, listen, I know it gets, it gets tougher to, to, to change habits when you get older, Right? We get accustomed to doing things one way, and we don't want to change, right? But if we're going to reach this generation that's out there now, we got to do things differently. The message don't change, but the methods have to change, okay? Otherwise, we'll be sitting here, and all of us will be 80, can't move. Ain't nothing wrong with 80. We got some beautiful 80-year-olds here. But I dare say, Sister Margaret Kirk, Sister Eva May Henry, Sister Margin Galloway will tell you they can't do the things that they did when they were 40. They can't do the same that they did when they were 25. So we need some, they need some younger folks to come out and undergird. They here to pray. It's, their, it's, 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 it's our season to serve them. Can I get a witness? They, 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 they led the way, so now let's serve them and rejoice with them as they, as they, as they tabernacle down here on this earth. But let's get busy being disciples. Amen? Amen? All right. I think I'm finished. Are y'all ready for me to stop? Okay, thank you. I'm going to stop then. Okay. <laughs> Jesus gave his life for you. And he died, desires for all of us to not just be converts, but to be disciples. And as your pastor, I'm going to pour into you all of those who want to be poured into I, can't, I don't have time to try to make you want the word. I don't. I really don't. It, life is too short. If you don't want this, you're not going to get it. So I'm, I, but I, I'm going to keep bringing it, but, I, but I'm not going to beg you because he said commit this to trustworthy people. 
Because if I give it to you, are you giving it to somebody else? Are you, are you? Are you trustworthy enough to carry it to somebody else? Only you can answer that. I may have my thoughts, but only you can answer that. Only you know if you're really ready to receive. Jesus gave his life for you. He died so that you could connect with the Holy God. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to be disciples? Are you really ready? Every head bowed, everybody close. Father, we lift you up. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you majesty. You're so precious, God. And I thank you, God, for the privilege to be able to share your word with these your people. Lord, I pray that everyone here heard the challenge to become disciple makers. God, I pray that everyone here understands that it's about submitting our will to your will. Oh God, I know sometimes we are hard-headed. I am too, God. And God, you have to deal with all of us hard-headed folks in a special way. But Lord, help each one of us get to the point to where in our life we hear your word, we get understanding, and we make a conscious decision to be obedient to it regardless of how we feel. I thank you now, Father, for this privilege and this honor to have shared the word with these, your people today. God, you've challenged us to become disciple makers. I love you now and praise you. Hallelujah. Now listen, before you can ever become a disciple maker, you must first of all become a convert. You must first of all accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're listening to it via live stream, or if you're here in the sanctuary and you're not really sure about your salvation, you're not really sure about what it means to be a born-again believer, I want to give you the opportunity today. It starts with a decision, guys. A decision to say, I surrender my will to your will, God. If you're here and you recognize that I'm not there yet and I want to be, then it's simply, that's the first step is recognize that you're not there. And the second step is, is to believe that the Bible was true when it says Jesus Christ was God manifested in human flesh. He died a sacrificial death out on Calvary's here, was buried in a borrowed tomb and resurrected the third day morning with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. If you can get to the point where you can believe in what Jesus did, then now it's just simply of saying, Lord, I surrender my will to that saving work. And I want to become a part of the family of God. Then you can become a part of the family of God. If that's you, via live stream or here in the service, just lift your hand in the service and live stream. Let us know that you prayed that prayer. Saying, Lord Jesus, I realize I need you in my heart. I believe that Jesus did what the Bible said he did. He died on the cross for my sins, was resurrected with full authority in his hand. And right now, I invite him into my heart to save me. I believe that and I receive that. If that's you, then lift your hands where you are. If you're here and you are saved, you say, Pastor, you know, you came, you came at me a little hard today about being a disciple. I, I know I'm saved, but, but I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I've been a little hesitant about becoming a disciple, being more involved. If that's you and, and, you, and you realize that you got some work that needs to be done and you really want special prayer, lift your hands where you are. I want to pray for you to become a disciple. Is there another? Come on, a disciple. Uh, uh, he said, not, don't go make converts, make disciples. But in order to make a disciple, you got to first be a disciple to one yourself. Is there another? Come on. Are you hungry? If you're there to say, Pastor, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't been hungry to, be, to go any further than what I'm going right now. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable coming to church. Uh, I'm comfortable having my own space. And I'm not really comfortable with some of the things you're talking about. But I'm willing to learn. If that's you, you're willing to learn, you're willing to grow, lift your hands. I'm going to pray for you right now, okay? I'm going to pray that God would prick your heart and mind to where it, it's such a burning passion that you can't help yourself. Let's pray. God, we come before your presence right now, and I lift up these believers in this auditorium right now, God, who, are, who, are, who understand and know, God, that there is a need for a deeper commitment to you.
Lord, you said in your word through the Apostle Paul as he wrote to Timothy to commit these, these teachings to trustworthy people who are able to pass it on to others also. God, I thank you right now that we are a body of believers, God. I'm confessing it. I'm calling those things which be not as though they were. I, we are a body of believers who have a hunger and a thirst for your word and are willing to become disciple makers. Lord, we love you now. We lift you up. We magnify you. We give you the glory down the match. Lord, give us the strength to go beyond our flesh and tap into the spirit realm to be that vessel you can use to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I love you now, and I thank you for this privilege and this honor. God, touch in a powerful way, God. Let your word resonate so strongly in our spirit that we can't rest until we get up and put our face in the book and begin to study your word. Thank you, God, for all that you do. For we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. All God's children said amen. Come on, give my hand to praise.